Let's get started. Welcome to all of you. I'm Rich Lyons, Dean of the Business School here, the Haas School at UC Berkeley. It is part of our Dean Speaker Series, and I appreciate having uh, so many of you here. Uh, as you probably know, our list of speakers for this series is just a remarkable group of people. The list is up on the website, so I won't walk you through all of it. Uh, the next talk I thought I would mention, it's coming up on September 25, and it's Joe Jimenez. Joe is one of our alums uh, from our MBA program, 1984. He is the CEO of the pharmaceutical giant Novartis, and so he occupies a very important seat as well, and that's it's going to be a wonderful talk, as is today's talk. So I, it is really an honor for me to be able to uh, introduce not just a remarkable industry leader, but also a friend. He and I were classmates together in graduate school, so I know, I know Gary well. Let me give you a little bit of background uh, on Gary. Uh, he has been successful at the very highest level uh, as a scholar, as an academic, and obviously as a business person. Uh, he is one of these people that proves that you can be remarkably capable in both of those domains at the same time. Uh, he was uh, at Harvard Business School for uh, nearly a decade, I think around a decade, as an associate professor. I remember, as I recall, he, he went directly from, from graduate school when we were there together uh, to Harvard Business School, taught there uh, in services management, so the area that he ultimately went into obviously is a, a strength for his and has been for a long, long time. Uh, he took an assignment at Harrah's Entertainment, uh, the predecessor to, to Caesar's Entertainment, uh, that was meant to be, or was thought probably to be about a two-year uh, leave of absence. Uh, he was so good at what he was doing, given his services management background and other, other gifts, that uh, they invited him to stay on, and he did remain on as the chief operating officer, and five years later, he was CEO himself of, uh, of Harris Entertainment. So today, as you know, with his uh, remarkable role as uh, CEO of uh, Caesars Entertainment, he has played uh, an enormous role. He's, been, uh, he's seen lots of changes in the industry, a great professionalization of the industry, as you will hear him talk about. Uh, it is, a, it, 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 it is a, a clearly a global player with, with some tripling of, of revenues and number of casinos uh, under, his, uh, under his watch. Um, lots of purchases and things that he may talk about, just very quickly, 2004 purchase of uh, Horseshoe Gaming, also the World Series of Poker, 2005 uh, acquisition uh, by Harris of Caesars Entertainment. Uh, in 2008 is when Caesars went private, that was a third, roughly $31 billion transaction. Uh, his insight into customers uh, is something we can all learn from. I think he's got a deceptively sis uh, dis simple uh, dictum or, or, or framework, and it's one that's been very powerful. Uh, one, know your customer. Know your customer. We all say that. Uh, he really knows how to do it. Target the most valuable among them and build their loyalty around your brand. And he is so focused on the value that gets created when you do those three things together and well, right? That's really uh, where he's remarkable. He, they've got a wonderfully successful loyalty program and also analytics program. He'll talk a bit about business analytics here today. Uh, more than 40 million customers, uh, best CEO by Institutional Investor Magazine, four years in a row. How do you do that? I don't know. Past chairman of the American Gaming Association. The list goes on and on. PhD in economics at MIT, which is where I got to know him. BA in economics from Wesleyan. It is a great pleasure to have Gary Loveman here today. Gary, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. What a pleasure. I owe this young man a lot of my professional uh, run because I was in his study group as a first year economics student at MIT along with two other very distinguished economists and it became clear to me in about the second week that if I had to compete with Rich Lyons and two of my other classmates in economics, I was in for a very unpleasant ride. So I decided I'd better find some third rail that used the principles of economics but didn't have to run up against the kind of intellect that I found in Rich and a few others, and not having any idea at the time that I'd wind up running a gambling business, that's where serendipity has led me. So my ambition this afternoon is to spend a few minutes in the context of the casino world, because it is kind of a fun place, and hopefully every last one of you have experienced it at some point, and will choose to do so again soon. <laughs> but I will do so not to convince you about the merits of the casino business or the specifics of the industry, but rather to try to elicit a few central themes about leadership in the long term that I've come to appreciate and hold dear uh, in periods where things are very easy and the world comes to us very nicely, and then in periods that we've experienced since 2008 where we have a lot of headwind and almost everything is hard. 
I have found these general notions to be somewhat controversial, but very powerful. And I would offer them to you as some unsolicited advice about some of the things you might want to think about as you go through a long career with a number of challenges and a number of transitions. So just as a word of background, Caesars is the largest casino gaming company in the world. We operate virtually everywhere in the United States where casino gaming is legal, some international locations. We offer the World Series of Poker. We have an emergent online business. We're one of the largest food and beverage businesses in the United States, one of the larger hoteliers. We have the single largest revenue generating performance venue, Caesars Coliseum, which has Celine and Elton and Shania and Cher and Rod Stewart and the rest. So we're in a lot of entertainment oriented very customer intensive types of businesses. And our customers experience these over a span of three or four days when they're with us, where they give us a lot of information about what they do, a lot of information about what they've chosen not to do, what sorts of preferences they have, what type of price responsiveness and offer responsiveness they have. And my career in this industry has been about collecting that information in a constructive fashion with the guest, and then trying to figure out what I can do to add value to generate incremental behavior. So as I used to tease my students when I was back at that vocational school on the Charles River, I would say, what is the role of marketing? And for me, the role of marketing is to profitably influence consumer behavior. It's to get someone to do something they wouldn't have done otherwise. Now, if you're selling a fabulous product, and hopefully some of you will have that chance off and on, it's relatively easy. Selling iPads in the first generation, selling the first IBM 360 computers, the first Fidelity 401k plan, that's marketing for sissies. What's tough is to sell a mediocre product or to sell a product that isn't gonna get better in the near term. And that is exactly the problem that I was asked to solve. When I showed up at Harris, a recovering academic, you can only imagine that things must have been tough. Otherwise, a qualified person would have been recruited to come and take this job. <laughs> Instead, they found a business school professor. Now, what's funny about business school professors is, while if you're very sick, you might ask a professor of medicine to make you better, if you're in terrible legal straits, you might ask a professor of law to take your case, but nobody thinks a professor of business could ever run a business. We're thought to be distracted and a little bit abstract and struggle with women and have all sorts of other problems <laughs> that would lead us to not be very successful. And you can see that was exactly the circumstances I found. In the near term, I wasn't gonna be able to change the product. The product was gonna be pretty much as I found it. And I had some pretty tough guys to compete with. Sheldon Adelson, now we're $30 billion. Steve Wynn, all I had was an 87 Honda and I was friends with Rich. <laughs> and as Rich pointed out, almost everyone thought I would be temporary. I was referred to within the company as the company kidney stone. I came on suddenly, I would hurt like crazy, but at some point I would pass and everybody would be okay. I was hired to solve a very specific problem. No one thought that I knew anything about how to deal cards or how to cook steaks in the buffet or any of these specific functional duties of the casino business. I was there to solve this problem. We had one casino in Vegas, Harrah's. It was worth 300 million bucks. 1999, Steve Wynn opens the Bellagio, $1.6 billion. At the time, people referred to it as the place God would build if he had the money. <laughs> Little did anyone know that 10 years later, just next door, someone would build something at $9.2 billion. And as you all know from your visits to Vegas, you can walk in any of these buildings for free. The casino games are available to you. They're the same games. They're offered under the same terms to everyone in the $300 million box, the $1.6 billion box, or the $9 billion box. It's all up to you. So if you're going to get people to go to the $300 million box, that's hard marketing. And that was the problem I was asked to solve. So what we needed to do when we couldn't change the product was to change the way people considered what product they would buy. We had to envelop them with a series of self-reinforcing motivations to choose in our favor. So we did so by trying to connect to our brands, by asking them to exchange information with us and allow us to make inferences about their preferences, and then try to offer them things that were increasingly relevant to their decision at an affordable cost to us. Now, we had two things going for us in this. First, it's a very data-intensive business, and customers have a history of being willing to trade information for goodies. And as you'll see in a minute, I have a lot of goodies. That helps. Second, it's a high-margin business with relatively frequent purchase. So think about all the range of businesses that you're involved with that have high margins, 
where customers make decisions relatively frequently, and where there is available to you quite a lot of information about what they have chosen to do. In any of these general circumstances, the ideas I'll describe to you are applicable. Lucky for me, no one had done so in the casino business. It was a somewhat marginalized business. It was occupied by a lot of people who'd been in it a long time. And coming to it literally as an innocent, I saw a big opportunity for intellectual arbitrage, taking the ideas born in consumer finance in places like Capital One and Advanta and American Express, and moving them in to try to arbitrage these opportunities in the casino business. What we wanted to do was to encourage you to visit encourage you to get a total rewards card. If you got one, we would give you back 20 cents of every dollar you gave us, and we would let you choose how you wanted to get the 20 cents back. And not only would we give it back to you, we wanted to give it back to you. This is not a loyalty program like an airline, where you collect points, then you hire an attorney, you beg for a flight, you look for full moon on leap year, <laughs> call at midnight, and maybe there'll be a seat available for you. That's not the gig. Our deal is, you play, we give you something back. You want food, you want show tickets, you want limousines, you want golf, you want retail, suite, your call. We know how much we can afford to give you, we know the margins in each of those categories, it's up to you. And to the degree I know specifically that Rich Lyons likes gourmet food and high-end shopping and Derek Dean prefers entertainment and golf, that's the leg up I have on the guy next door who has a prettier box with the same games inside. So the idea was solicit information, make an offer, wait for a response, learn from the response, make a new hypothesis, generate a new offer, and continue to do so routinely. Now, there had been a big history of this in the casino business, with very high-end players getting highly customized, individualized service from our VIP hosts. But that wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to do this for 45 million people, some of whom visit us 15 times a month. So they might teach us something on Tuesday, we needed to learn from it by Friday, and make sure that the visit on Friday reflected what had happened on Tuesday. Now one of the big opportunities in this, and this comes in almost every business you all are gonna be involved in, is the stochastic nature of the experience. First night I'm on the job, literally the first night, I left a Harvard classroom in the morning, I was in Atlantic City in the evening. I'm walking through the casino through a row of people playing slot machines, I say, how are you doing tonight, sir? He says, shitty. <laughs> now, you've all been well-raised. You're accustomed to these kinds of dialogues. How are you today, sir? I'm well, thank you. How about those giants? A's are having a good year. You know that one. How are you doing? Shitty. How, how shitty are you? you know? <laughs> it's a whole scatological conversation. It's very tough. The person who's losing disproportionately hates you. The guy who's winning disproportionately loves you. Both of these are opportunities. The random nature of the business provided this tremendous opportunity to say to people in every circumstance, what can we do informed by the evidence that would move you to have a more loyal experience with us than you would have had otherwise? And if every person who works here knows that that's what makes the business move, that's what we're gonna do. So in the first years of my tenure in employee dining rooms, break rooms, smoking lounges, three shifts a day, day, swing, and night. I talk to employees about the need to get two more people every shift to love us for those reasons. Why are you having a bad experience? Or, well, I can't win at this slot machine. Well, you know what, why don't you do this? Take a break, we'll lock this machine, go have a steak on us. Here's $20 more, maybe that'll change your luck. Because in the law of large numbers, it probably will. He'll revert to the mean, the experience will be better, and he'll know that someone was empathetic. So using both scientific means and direct interventions, we tried to drive an improvement.
So what that commercial is intended to elicit is the notion that we want to make the experience what you want it to be. So I hope you've all seen the crowning achievement of American cinema, a film called Hangover. <laughs> Happened to have been filmed at our hotel, at Caesars Palace, and it was very popular among gamblers. We had a fellow, a Chinese player who had spent $5 million with us in a given year, decided that he wanted to celebrate his 40th birthday by reliving Hangover. <laughs> now, it turns out most of the things that happen in Hangover are illegal in Clark County. You can have the evening with Mike Tyson. He comes by periodically. You can have a tiger under appropriate conditions. You can have lots of attractive friends. We can make a nice party. And we did for this fellow. And he's been rather loyal to us ever since. I can't do that for a $100 slot player in Kansas City, but I can find out what the equivalent is for the $100 slot player in Kansas City. In the early years of my tenure, if you weren't working on this problem, you weren't going to get anyone's attention in our company. In a few minutes, I'll focus on what I think the critical lessons of this experience might be for each of us, but one of them is the critical importance of focus. Very highly talented, accomplished people like yourselves walk around with long lists of things to do, and everything on the list is meritorious. But in most jobs, only two or three things ultimately matter. A lot of things have to meet a certain condition, but the things that drive the business are much more limited and impactful. And in this company, with challenge merchandise and a history of poor performance in 1998, this was it. How do you build loyalty with a challenge product to move loyalty in form of visits in the near term? If you weren't working on that, you probably weren't working on something important. If we could get that right, we would finance all the changes in the product that would lead to things like Caesars Palace and the World Series of Poker and Horseshoe and the quality of product that we all wanted to have. And that's exactly what ultimately happened, beginning with the first use of analytics-driven experimentation in 1998. By January of 1999, we knew it was working. We began to develop it across our footprint. The amount of yield we drove from every unit of gaming that we provided was at a significant premium to our competitors, which allowed us to buy our competitors, consolidate the industry and consolidate our business, go from 14,000 people to 90,000 people, 14 casinos in one country to 54 casinos in seven countries, and take the share price from about $14 to what TPG and Apollo paid in 2008 at $90 a share. That singular focus on what could drive a customer to make one more decision in our favor based on things they taught us they cared about was essential. Now, you all live in the middle of this explosion of these sorts of ideas in Silicon Valley. Despite the incredible technology advance, you have to recognize as a consumer that very rarely does anyone really do this. You are constantly giving a provider a wealth of information, and they are doing nothing with it. So you're a Verizon, you're an AT&T customer. They know literally everything, the most intimate details of your life. You walk in the store for service, and who gets served first? The person who came first, not the person who's worth the most. You come in my casino, the person who gets served first is the person who's worth the most. Even though they could do precisely the same thing, they've chosen not to do it consistently. The person who gets the best service at the Apple store is not the person with the greatest lifetime service to the Apple corpor or, uh, wealth to the Apple corporation. It's whoever got the smartest guy or gal in the blue shirt. So despite such a tremendous availability of capability, this issue remains as a central opportunity in my view. The question then is, where do you take it next? Start with a simple idea. It's time for some fun. Plan, plan, plan more. Stop planning, start doing. Go see your host, get hooked up, arrive in style. Make a new friend who makes you feel like an old friend. Finally understand what the saying, make yourself at home, is really all about. Tweet it. Get ready while you're getting ready. Hit the ground running. Hit the slots. Hit the tables. Go all in. Take a spin. Shop till you drop. What's your whistle? Catch a show. And another show. Want more? You've got choices. More choices. Never too many choices. Are you not entertained? Oh, you're entertained. Lines? What lines? You don't have time for lines. Dance your ass off. Sleep. Okay, that's enough sleep. Hit the pool. Hit the spa. Hit the links. Hungry? It's time to chow down. Eat here. And here. And even here. Still hungry? We can do this all day. Can't choose just one dish? Then don't. Eat that, and that, and that too. Squeeze every last drop out of the weekend. Take a victory lap. Give credit where it's due. Say goodbye to your new friends. Head home. 
and then get ready to do it all again. So one of the second lessons of this experience is around adaptability. When you listen to programs like CNBC and others, they'll describe people with jobs like mine as having been some type of CEO. He was the marketing CEO. He was the financial CEO. She was the creative CEO. But of course, if you want to do this job for very long, you can't be any one of those things. You have to be much more flexible, still deeply capable in something, but much more fungible. In our world, all the tools we built in 1998 to send a letter to someone saying, come see us in St. Louis on Friday night and we'll give you this is being undone by the availability of much more modern methods to connect with our guests electronically, to connect with them real time, to yield manage our assets as guests are in the market, to respond to what they're saying about us in social media and to be the sort of provider that this guy hopes we can be and to completely transform all these same tools driven by the same economics, the same engines, the same analytic insight, inferential methods, but transformed rather fundamentally. And to build the organization, attract the right people, provide the right incentives to make that transformation work quickly. In Vegas in particular, as you saw this fellow game a little bit, people are gaming less and less, particularly in Vegas. They want to do other things. They want to go to nightclubs, they want to go to day clubs, they want to go shopping, they want to go to shows, they want to go to avant-garde shows, they want to go to electronic daisy carnival, they want to do electronic dance music, they want to do all sorts of other things. The gaming pie is flat, if not shrinking slightly, heavily focused on a few very big customers, and now more and more of our folks are interested in a lot of other things. So all the tools I built in 2008, 2009, or I'm sorry, 1998, 1999, so heavily gaming-centered, now have to become available to a much wider audience. And if you look at how our capital is allocated and the types of activities we're engaged in, you see that manifested in so many ways. We now have a billion dollars of capital development taking place on the Las Vegas Strip, including this development called The Link, leading to this new, very modern observation wheel. Using one of the bad gaming metaphors I've come to love, it's called the high roller. There's not one dollar of gaming capacity in this development. There's not one new slot machine. There's not one table game. Everything that goes on here in this area that will come to be a Vegas version of the Grove or Faneuil Hall is devoted to people who are coming to see us principally for reasons other than gaming. The empirics lead us in that direction. Everything we come to know about our customers tell us that this is where we need to go. And the vehicles that you'll travel in, the entertainment experience that'll be available to you when you're in it beginning early next year, all embody that experience that you just saw this gentleman have. Instead of having people running around asking you about cocktails, we put technology in front of you at the game, we reflect the preferences of your previous visits, and we offer you things, we change the operational methods to get them to you more quickly and more accurately. All of these various types of interventions to make the digital experience relevant to what is really a traditional experience fundamentally. We set up our interactive subsidiary five years ago to bring the World Series of Poker online for money. And we've spent a lot of time in Congress trying to make it legal for that to happen in the United States. Unfortunately, we haven't succeeded. In the meantime, something else happened called social gaming, where people play games largely for fun, or they pay small amounts of money to play, and many of them enjoy playing games that have a casino thematic. We bought a company in Tel Aviv called Playtica that brings games like Slotomania, Caesars Casino Online, Bingo Blitz, Scratch That, World Series of Poker, onto mobile devices. More than 100 million people around the world now carry these games, our games, on their devices. Unlike my other services, these games are legal for every human being in the world to play because they're not gambling, they're just social games. Now our customers play these games at home, they play our games in the casino, they play these games on the way to the casino. It's becoming a much more enveloping experience including now, finally, in the United States, in Nevada, and shortly in New Jersey, the ability to offer things like the World Series of Poker online for money. I love poker. I even played the World Series a couple times. Trouble is, when I win, I can't always control my excitement. Apparently, it's not proper poker etiquette to celebrate when you take people's money. But now I don't have to worry. The World Series of Poker is online, so I can celebrate however I please. The World Series of Poker is online for real money in Nevada, only at WSOP.com, where the action is. Now, the beauty of this offering in Nevada is, unlike any of our competitors 
who have a branded poker product, we have both the offline fulfillment and the online fulfillment. So you play World Series of Poker online with us, you qualify for the tournament in Las Vegas, you can use the benefit of your play online to have rooms and beverage and entertainment and other benefits when you're with us in our casinos around the world. The combination of the offline and the online offering is unique and we think powerful. So if you look at the transformation of this in the aggregate from where we began in 98 to today, you see the confluence of all these events. The combination of the online offering, the pre-experience before you get to us, the post-experience when you comment about us, the real-time experience when you're frustrated with us while you're standing online to check in, along with all of the assets that we bring to bear. That's the management problem that we're trying to tackle. But in the heart of it is exactly the same notion that got us started 13 years ago. The need to learn about the guest, what he or she prefers, and how we can make that available to them, you're almost irrespective of the relative quality of the product that's available for us to offer them. So that's a little bit of the history of where these ideas came from. What I'd like to do in a final few minutes is talk about what I've learned as a student of this as the critical messages for leadership, since no matter where you all work, that's what you aspire to do. Comment a little bit about the tensions in these and take your questions and talk about anything that's on your mind. As I mentioned, the first of these is the critical importance of focus. So imagine an academic, never held a legitimate job in his life, shows up to be the chief operating officer of a casino company. Imagine all the things about which I knew nothing. You can't overestimate the number of things about which I was ignorant. I couldn't teach anybody how to cook better, couldn't teach them how to deal cards better, couldn't teach them how to build parking garages better, but I could try to get customers to prefer us over someone else when they made a visit in our markets. And that focus brought about everything else. Now, most of you are far too young to remember this, but in 1998-99, websites for companies were just emerging. We had a terrible website. It was terrible. And talented young people from places like the Haas School would come to me almost every week and say, Gary, your website is terrible. We were embarrassed. Our, our friends and neighbors won't speak to us in church. It's so bad. We have to do something. We're, we can't, we're not allowed in Silicon Valley. I said, I know. It's terrible, and you can't touch it. I won't give you a dollar. No one can touch the website, because at the moment, I don't know how to make money out of it, and I have too many pressing obligations to move customers to choose us with respect to loyalty. The website didn't get a dollar for three years. By the time we got to it, we had some idea what to do with it. And the same thing was true for many other deserving categories. When you're in a job, particularly when you're new in a job and you've arrived in an important position, Ask yourself not what's the long list of things I could do, but rather what are the two or three things in this business, in this job, that are going to make a difference. You can't be incompetent or malfeasant on the other things, but you'll never get ahead doing pretty well at everything. You'll only get ahead doing really, really well at a few very important things. I don't know any profession where that fails to be true. So when I took this job, I had a little list, and it had two parts to it the things I needed to focus on substantively, and the people I needed to focus on substantively. Who needed to feel like my arrival was not a kidney stone? Who needed to feel like this was good for them in order for my experiment to be a success? And I had to work those people, like the CFO, and the leaders of operations, and the head of the Nevada business, and the senior regulator, and a few others, as hard as I worked those substantive issues. And if I could work that small set of things, I had a reasonable likelihood that I would succeed. And every day I would ask myself, have I advanced that set of issues? And I would encourage you to do a similar sort of thing. Second, if you think about me versus Steve Wynn, just as an extreme example, Steve is not an empiricist, and I am. And let me describe what I have in this odd comparison. On the right is June Cleaver or Lucille Ball, one of the famous mothers of old-time television. To the left is Courtney Love, not widely known as one of the great mothers of the recent experience. <laughs> the funny thing about motherhood or fatherhood is that it, we all care deeply about it, but none of us think we do it poorly. None of us think we're below average at it. So if I were to ask all the ladies in the room who are mothers to raise their hand, and then ask which of you believe you are below average mothers, and then if I were to call on any one of you and just ask you in a public setting, is it possible you're a below average mother? Just consider it. All of a sudden your heart would be fluttering, 
there'd be a flush of adrenaline, it would feel miserable because that's such a dear notion, the quality of our parenting or the care of our elders. The same thing applies in professional work. You all have come to this point because you've been successful at virtually everything you've done. So virtually all the feedback you've had has been positive. You are bright students, you are accomplished athletes, great musicians, talented linguists. Here you are, you got into the Haas school, now you're at a great school, you're doing great. Therefore, there's a tight causal connection between everything you have done having worked. So you think you know a lot. Where do you get trapped in when that empiricism wants to tell you it's not right and you can't see it? A very famous colleague of mine at Harvard made a living writing stories called teaching how smart people how to learn. And his argument was the smarter and more accomplished we are, the poorer our qualities of learning. We become so accustomed to being right that we can't be challenged to consider that we're not. And as a leader, I believe this to be the central challenge. When can you anticipate instances when your approach will fail you? When can you anticipate circumstances when the people working around you aren't making the right decisions? How do you determine who is the bad mother? If you find me 100 mothers, there are 10 that aren't very good. Surely there are some bad mothers. There have to be some below average. The same thing applies. Steve has tremendous visceral commitment to the decisions he makes, and he is a genius in our business. But he is fundamentally not empirical. That leads him to make some spectacularly good decisions and some spectacularly bad ones. I'm just at the other end. I don't have his level of vision. But I am trained as an empiricist. I'm very good at looking at evidence and not feeling a high degree of attachment to any central theme, just being driven by where the evidence leads me. So that leads me to not make a lot of categorical mistakes of doing things I shouldn't have done, but it does lead me to make a number of mistakes of not doing things I should have done. So when Steve Wynn offered me a sub-concession in the Macau gaming market for $900 million, I applied a series of tools to determine if that price was reasonable and determined it was too high and I passed. And it was the biggest mistake of my life in terms of business. I should have paid 900. In fact, I could have paid a lot more and it would have been right. Steve was convinced it was worth it and he was absolutely right. The day after I turned it down, Jamie Packer and Lawrence Ho bought it for $900 million and they've proven to be absolutely right. So having some degree of self-reflection about what type of decision maker you're going to be and recognizing the weaknesses of each is important. Many of you will work in organizations where decisions are made largely by hunch and experience. When you notice people saying things like, I saw this once before and it went this way, you're in a business where people make decisions largely on experience. If on the other hand, someone says, let's run an experiment, let's look at this group of people exposed to one provocation and these in the control group and let's look to see what happens, you're in a very different place. Each of them has their own vulnerabilities. The critical thing is that you know which is which. I believe every day I'm in this job longer that this is a much more durable approach. You'll miss a few things, you won't get a lot of things badly wrong by overcommitting, and you will have a much greater likelihood to see where the world needs you to go than if you're driven largely by just conviction. Third, the critical role of honesty, which seems to be in very short supply in business today. You turn on CNBC in the morning and you'll see people like me telling you how great everything is in their company. When do you turn on CNBC and the person says, Mr. or Ms. CEO, how's business? And they say, well, it's really kind of shitty. We just can't get out of our own way, you know? We're, we keep trying things, the products aren't that good, customers don't really like it. But sometimes that's exactly right. If you want to be a leader with a high degree of credibility over a long period of time, you got to tell the truth almost all the time in a way that particularly the people in your own organization come to believe. So when there's bad news, you're the first person to tell them. And when there's good news, let somebody else tell them. When something went wrong, it's always your fault. When something went right, it's never you who did it. That's the combination you're looking for. People will always give you enough credit. You just don't have to be the one seeking it. The average tenure of a Fortune 500 CEO is four years. So I've been in this job 11 years, and I don't own a controlling interest in the company. One of the ways I've been able to do this is not because I get everything right. It's because when something bad happens, my directors hear it from me first. And I'm always accountable. 
every time. My directors, David Bonderman, Leon Black, Mark Rowan, when something goes wrong, the first person they hear from is me, and they'll hear from me before they hear from anyone else, and it's never anyone's fault but mine. That's it. And that's not to be a hero, but that's to set the right tone in the business for what we're doing. And I would ask, you will find this to be a much more pervasive issue than you might imagine. I've shown you two examples on this slide of people who I think have gotten it very, very right. Alan Mulally, when he came to Ford as a Lexus driver, told everyone at Ford he owned a Lexus because the Ford cars weren't that good. And if they wanted to get better, they needed to build better cars. And lo and behold, they have. And the company has done very well. The gentleman who ran Netflix made a strategic error. It was one any of us could have made. Immediately took accountability, immediately apologized to his customers and his shareholders, and has built and continued to build a spectacular business. Intellectual humility, how little we know about what we're doing, how much we have to learn in every instance, and a dedication to doing it honestly. And then finally, this idea of false dichotomies. I grew up in a world in business where a lot of things went right. So people saw things that were consistently moving in the same direction. Sadly, you all are generational victims. It ain't gonna be that easy. The last five years has not been a world where a lot of things have gone right. So now you gotta do things that are often ostensibly conflicting. What does that mean? I go to my employees in 2009, I tell them, you all are taking a 5% salary cut. There's gonna be no improvement in merit increase this year. There's gonna be staffing reductions, and I'm buying the Planet Hollywood for $900 million. He says, what? You're, you're gonna pay $900 million for another hotel, and you're telling me to take a 5% salary cut? We hate you. Those things can't exist in nature at the same time. But of course they did. Planet Hollywood has been one of the investments we've ever made. And in today's world, you're constantly doing these things. You're disinvesting and investing. You're reducing and growing. You're going to the left and to the right. And you're always having to explain to people, how could this be true? How could I be asking you to sacrifice this, while on the other hand, I'm doing that? How can I pay the people at CIE a multi-million dollar bonus, while you all, who work right next to them, aren't making anything like that? Well, what does that mean? You gotta be honest. You gotta spend a lot of time on education. You gotta make sure people understand why these ostensibly conflicting things are happening consistently right before their eyes and then go on to show what you've been able to accomplish as a result. I have found, particularly in recent years, this to be the hardest thing. So here we've got the incoming quarterback of the Green Bay Packers standing with a big smile, putting his arm around the guy he's about to displace. So I gotta learn from you, but I really want your job. There's all these conflicting signals going on, and for Mr. Favre, his job was to play as best he could, but make sure the guy who would succeed him would be as prepared as possible to take the job when he did, and so on. So these four notions, at least as 11 years in this job, have served me reasonably well, and no matter what the product is we're trying to sell or the manager we're trying to develop, these central tendencies come back to me repeatedly. So I'm gonna pause there, and in our remaining time, take your questions and comments on whatever topic this has provoked or anything else that's on your minds. Those are wonderful and enduring insights. Now, I have to ask you to use the microphone, but please don't be bashful. So we have, uh, bashful. We have an online audience. I'll take the first question from the online audience, please. So GC Liao is one of our executive MBAs, has the question, can you comment on Caesars Macau operation and the recent selling of the property, how this will affect Caesars' long-term strategy on Chinese and Asian market? Uh, sure, but I'm gonna do that in the context of these lessons we've been trying to talk about because uh, there's lots of specifics about Macau. So we missed Macau. The Macau licenses, there were six of them, they became available. There, were only, there was really only one I ever had a shot at and I blew it. We made an effort in 2006 to try to recover from that by buying a scarce piece of real estate that we thought could provide us leverage into that market in the future. The Chinese government's position evolved to a point where it was very clear to me that they would not welcome another American operator in Macau. If there was ever gonna be another operator, it would not be Caesars Entertainment. So we felt that selling the land we had, which was half a billion dollar piece of land, to a Chinese owner who had much better access to re-entitlement rights with the government would be the right decision. 
this is a painful experience here because it's really the last uh, acknowledgement that we are not going to find ourselves in the biggest gaming market. We are the biggest gaming company in the world, but we are not in the most important gaming market because when that opportunity came, we missed it. And this is kind of our final way to, to walk away gracefully and use that money for more productive uh, purposes elsewhere. Sir. Uh, can you use the microphone, please? Right there. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, your biggest problem was uh, loyalty uh, in the early stages, and you were trying to build on that. Um, what about you know getting the news out and getting people to understand that you were offering a very, very different service? Was that something that happened organically, or did you have to do a lot of education and a lot of work to sort of uh, uh, drive that message? Internally or externally? Externally. Externally. We had to, to do a lot of messaging around that. But we also had to rely on the power of the word of mouth of the people who were visiting us. Like a Starbucks, we're the most heavily visited entertainment provider in the United States. We have more people walk in our doors than Disney has walk in theirs. So if we can do something catalytic with those experiences, then we can get a lot of enthusiasm going. Now, we also did some more clever things. So we ran promotions that ensured new guests against losses. We called it Play $100 on Us. Come in, and if you lost up to $100 playing slots with us, we would reimburse you the $100 on your next visit. So we would lower the risk of having a bad experience as a first-time visitor. We would intercept first-time visitors, encourage them in person, make sure if they were having a bad visit, we did something to turn it around. So we focused very extensively on this. Now, I would add, there's a lot of people who will never visit a casino. There's nothing you can do to get them there. So you have to be analytically quite surgical about what sort of person is likely to come see you and what sort of person isn't and make sure that your resources are focused accordingly. Yeah, please. Uh, hello. Uh, you talk about a lot of getting all the company involved in this strategy about service. And you see a lot of that in many companies trying to get the operational guy, get the finance guy, talk about their customer and all of the consumer. So can you give us some pointers on, on how to do that, how to get all yeah. the people thinking about it? Yeah, I, I would love to, but I want to contest the premise. So you, you'll find this hard to believe, but I found myself in an IKEA for the first time recently. And I, I, I've heard about IKEA, I've never been in one. So I walked in one, and it's quite an impressive place. It's voluminous. If you like casinos, you got to love IKEA. Right? <laughs> but there aren't any people to help you there. So you walk in. And it's if you're in a world where everyone speaks Swedish and you don't know anything, right? And if you find a person, just look for this the next time you're in the setting, and you approach them, look for their body language. Now, if they're happy to see you, they're going to say, oh, hello, welcome to Ikea. We're glad to have you. Instead, when you approach them on Ikea, they're going to go, they, they really, they think like, shit, they found me. <laughs> you know, I was just on my way to the break room. I was going to go reorder the door hangers or something, and this guy found me. Damn it, now I'm stuck. Right? I just don't believe that most frontline service providers or online service providers are yet at a point where they are seeking a chance to help. And I think you as customers know this. When you're out buying things, you're shopping, you're not finding the reception that you deserve, particularly if you have a problem. Just test it. Come to someone and say, I've got great news, and look at them. And then come to them and say, I have a problem. And they're like, oh, shit, you have a problem? When it ought to be just the opposite. Because if you have a problem, that's the greatest profit opportunity that person's going to have today. When there's a problem, you can win the person over remarkably. Whereas when everything is going well, it's not likely you're going to have an inspired visit. So what we did started with the notion that this is how we're going to make money. The stock was 14 bucks a share. We had 37% of our customers' wallet. So I went literally, as I said, to every employee dining room, every break room, every cocktail server, every valet parker, and I said, here's the deal. If we can get from 37% of our customers' wallet to 40, the stock will be $30 a share, and you'll all get bonuses. Now, how's 37? 37 sucks. 37 is terrible. You call home and say, Mom, I got a 37. It's an awful number. It's an indictment on what we're doing. How's 40? It's terrible, but it's better than 37. Right? So let's aim for 40. And that means one or two customers in your next eight-hour shift tells you they'll come one more time this year. We're going to be a very successful company. And then we're going to go sell this crummy casino, and we're going to buy the good one next door. 
and we're gonna have a better offering, and look where this thing's gonna go. That's what we did. Every person, all the time, focused on that message. Uh, one more online here, and then we'll take one in the back. Karthik uh, Jalamangala is one of our Evening Awakened students asks, with the dramatic explosion of cloud and mobile technologies today, if you were to start over again today, what would you do differently? I'm not sure we do that much differently. I think the, the tremendous processing capacity of these technologies allow us to do much deeper analytic work faster. So for example, we focused early on on worth categories and uh, how people's luck had been running. Today we are looking much more at behavioral categories. In a world where revenues are flat, we're finding a higher degree of dispersion among otherwise equivalent people. So a few people are playing a lot more, a few people are playing a lot less, and there doesn't seem to be much we can do to influence them. So we're looking within categories based on near-term dynamics and trying to do things to really encourage the incliners and to try to slow down the decliners. All of this requires a lot of computational capacity, a lot of big data architecture, and that's really the difference. You can get really cool analytics done in a, in a way that operating executives can manage. We have a 200-person analytic team. that sit, These are all applied mathematicians, operations people that sit at the Flamingo Hotel uh, together and work on exactly these problems. First, thank you very much for coming. I would, I'm curious about this analytics, especially with regards to your people management. I imagine you've taken that same skill that you've reflected on your customers and then turned it inside. So with those lessons learned, especially the empiricism, how have you managed to find and put the right people in the right places? Uh, we don't do it as well as we do on the customer side. But we do work hard, Rich and I talked about this earlier, at trying to focus on recruitment and the cultivation of the right people coming in the door. So imagine in your, uh, your own families, some person who everyone goes to when there's a problem, and imagine someone else in your family who's a very good person, but no one goes to them when there's a problem. I want the first person. So I want tools that help me identify that person. So some of these I can observe through automated methods, and some of these I can observe through peer interview sessions. I can have my 12 best cocktail servers interview incoming cocktail servers once they've been vetted to a certain degree and help me choose the ones that are likely to be like the 12 best ones I have. Uh, panel interviews, as we describe it. So a combination of some analytic methods, that is to say, looking diagnostically at data and then making inferences and predictions, and then some much more uh, interactive behavioral things that we do uh, to try to lead to the same point. Can we have time for just a couple more quick questions? Any more? Please. We have one more from online then, please. Uh, Arvind is one of our EW MBAs. Thanks for the wonderful talk. The most difficult person to convince is the first one. How did you convince your internal customers, direct staff, that your approach was well, correct? Well, it's a great question. And the first most important thing was I was the chief operating officer. My boss at the time was considering hiring me as the head of marketing. If I had been hired as the head of marketing, I would today be teaching school at the Harvard Business School. Because while I might have tried to do all the same things, I would not have the authority to overcome the inertia in the system. Because I had P&L responsibility, at least for some period of time, people had to do largely what I wanted them to do. So when you think about positions you're taking on and what type of situational authority you have in those positions, very important to be clear-headed about what is manageable to accomplish there and what method you need to do it versus others. Having had that authority, at least temporarily, I set up a scoreboard that people thought was legitimate and then we proceeded to measure ourselves against that scoreboard. And the company having had the problems you observed early on, having seen the promise of this, all of a sudden, people who wanted to do better thought this was a pretty interesting way to get there. And increasingly would jump on board and decide that this really made a lot of sense. So it gathered a lot of momentum, but it involved being very clear about what we were gonna do, how we would measure our results, and then what people could do to, to make themselves part of that experience. Thanks, Gary. There was one last one here. Was it this hand? Please use the microphone. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Amr Doshi. I'm a part of the Executive MBA program. A uh, question for you is, as an academic coming in and through your years of experience, how did you kind of deal with making these decisions? Did you have certain techniques you used to get over analysis paralysis uh, to actually make these kind of decisions and focus on your priorities that you talked about? Right. I think you have to distinguish two types of decisions. So in a company like mine, we have lots of operational decisions. Operational decisions most companies can overcome if they get wrong. If we misprice the hotel or we close something or we have the wrong entertainer, we can fix those. 
and I didn't experience much of any paralysis around those lines. I think, I hope that you emerge from this program or your own experience with a decision framework, whether it's driven by mathematics or it's driven by inferences or experience, that will lead you to feel confident you have a, a relevant amount of knowledge to make the decision and make it crisply. And I'm going to come back to that last point in a second. In more far-reaching decisions, like acquisitions or big capital deployment decisions, this is where companies really run aground, there you have to have a great deal more analytic framework, more consensus, and you have to make sure you avail yourselves of people that either already have a contrary view or who are put in the position of offering a contrary view so that you fully vet both sides of the argument before you reach a, a principal decision. Now, one final thought on this. As you rise through the ranks, as all of you will, you will get more decisions wrong. This always strikes everyone as counterintuitive. But by the time anything comes to me as a decision, a lot of smart people have already not made it. All the easy decisions are taken. <laughs> Nobody gives me an easy one. Right? All I get are the hard ones. So you got to expect that if you're going to get paid a lot of money to make decisions, they better be hard ones. And if they're hard ones, and if you're in a competitive industry where the person you're trying to beat is just as smart as you are and very well informed, you're not going to get them all right. But if you go into it with the notion that you're going to get them all right, and that's how you're going to judge yourself, you're just a fool. That's never going to happen. You're going to make some wrong. You're going to have made them for the right reason and get them wrong. And then the issue is, what, how did I get it wrong? What did I miss? What can I learn from this? How do I make the basis of my having gotten it wrong a lesson to everyone else so we can get more of them right? So when I meet with our new managers, new employees, I talk a lot about all the things I've gotten wrong. And I tell them, there's nothing you could do to screw up as badly as I have. And look, I've turned out OK. You're never going to cost the company a billion dollars. You're never going to blow $5 million on a bad piece of theater. You're, it's OK. Let's talk about how we're going to make these decisions and what you're going to be able to do, and then be willing to own up to the ones, uh, the ones that didn't quite go your way. So many lessons in that, right? As we think about empiricism and analytics, we, we heard about helping smart people to continue to learn. We heard about intellectual humility. Uh, we talk a lot about students always, confidence without attitude. Many elements of what we're about came through in spades in your talk. Gary Loveman, thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you.